So part two of our mini masterclass of how does your music get to the screen. Today's subject is scoring mixer. In some cases, recording and scoring uh, mixer. Um, an engineer who's gonna take all of your bits and combine them and mix them and deliver them in a meaningful way to the dub stage, which we already talked to Ron Bartlett about what he gets at the dub and how he uses it. Um, I have had the opportunity to work with so many great engineers in my life in Canada and in LA and in UK and in Prague and all over the world. But the one I've spent the most time with is our esteemed guest, Alan Meyerson, who is very graciously donating his time, again, for free for you guys to talk about from his perspective, what he needs from you, the composer, the music team, in order to be able to do the best job he can mixing your music and delivering it in a meaningful way to the dub stage. Um, Alan has a rock and roll background from New York, which he brought with him to LA, and I think that's one of the reasons, in my opinion, that he and Hans Zimmer are such a great fit together, because they're always progressing, they're always pushing forward, and that's very much a, a symbiotic relationship, and they've done, to say legendary work together would probably not even do it justice. So um, <clears throat> it's a real treat to have the insight from the from the point of view of a mixer of this level for you guys. Uh, he's just he's just a living legend. There's no other way to say it. So I'm grateful for his time. You should be too. Grab a pen and paper. I want to take some notes on this one. Um, any comments? Please leave them below. I know Alan's going to be chiming in as well. Excited to share this. Um, scoring, kind of mixing, delivering dub stage mentality from the point of view of one of our legendary mixers. So. Hope you enjoy this. Take some notes, like, and subscribe. Rock on. Hi, everyone. Al Myerson here. That was my friend Luigi. It's Lisa behind the camera, my girl. Uh, my buddy Trevor has asked me to uh, give you guys my thoughts on Synth Masters for his Ask Me Anything segment. Um, so I'm going to do that. Things are not in any particular order, sort of stream of consciousness, but I'll give you the things I look for and the things that are helpful for a mix engineer. The first thing that's really, really important is every single track in the synth master should be the same length. Usually you want to start them at bar one and go to two or three bars after the end. The reason you want to go past the end is so the reverb tails that you have obviously last. And if I make a reverb tail and I'm trying to make it the same region length as yours, I have a little room to do that. Um, don't print too hot. You know, a lot of people do that. You want to get your mixes hot. You want people to hear it, but you should be careful of your levels. If when you look at your regions inside of either Pro Tools or Cubase or whatever you're in, and you see you're squaring it off like it looks like a pop record, you're probably running individual tracks too hot. It's very hard to handle. When I get really, really hot tracks, I end up clip gaining them down, sometimes a lot, sometimes 12, 15 dB, because I need a little headroom to work with too. But not only that, it just doesn't sound as good, you know? Basically, you got to know that at some point it's going to get sort of limited and mastered. And if you're if you're smart, you try to do that only once. So if you do it and then I do it again, it starts to get too much and you start really hearing sort of the crunchiness on it. Um, if you process your stereo bus and that stuff isn't committed to the individual tracks, it's going to be very, very hard for me to match. So if you're working with a lot of mastering compression, stereo bus compression, and then you're sending me tracks that haven't gone through that, I'm really starting from, uh, you know, behind the starting line. So I then have to catch up. So the two ways to do that is either give me those settings or, you know, try to work. And I know that this is very hard because some of you are so used to working that way. Try to work without radical bus or mastering compression on the stereo mix so that your stems have the ability to sort of match it somewhat. Um, the way I like things separated, I think of things in three different formats in two different directions. So in every sort of food group that you're dealing with, uh, you think low, mid, high. So the low synths, the mid synths, the high synths, the basses, the cellis, the viola, the violins, the low percussion, the mid percussion, the high percussion, and then I think horizontal and vertical. So what I mean by that is the vertical would be all of the rhythmic elements, things that obviously create rhythm should be separate from the linear things that are creating the chords and stuff like that, or the lines. It's really, really good for me to have that stuff separately because obviously I might want to add a different reverb to something if it's just, um, you know, like a beautiful sweeping synth sound than I would for something with a lot of rhythm, you know, it's going to be completely different. So the more separation I can get, the better. I'm assuming most of you are working in stereo. And the reason I say that is 
um, if you are working with reverb and you embed your reverb on a stereo track, it really puts me and ultimately you at a major disadvantage because then when I go to make it surround, I'm limited in the ways I can do that because since if I want to make your reverb surround, well, I can't really do that without making a dry signal surround or if I want to make, you know, it gets messy. So, so uh, if it's just a generalized reverb, I say turn it off and let me do it for you. I have your ref mix. You're welcome to tell me what the reverbs are and let me start from that as a starting point. But if it's just a generalized reverb, turn it off. If it's a specialty reverb or an effect that you built up on like a solo sound or a vocal that's an integral part of the sound, if it's embedded, it's embedded, I'll deal with it. And that doesn't, you know, I'll make it great. But if it's possible to separate the dry signal from all of the effects and give me the effects on a separate track, that's a huge advantage. One second. Ah. You know, your mouth gets dry when you talk as much as I do. Um, the reverb thing is really important because it, it, it just makes it so much harder to give you that clarity and definition. You know, it just sort of becomes all a bigger version of stereo as opposed to a really depthful surround experience. Um, having said that, and I know most of you um, aren't going to have this opportunity, but a lot of the people I work with, they... Uh, work in whatever their uh, sequencing rig is, be it Cubase or Logic, and then they go out of Logic into Pro Tools and they're already sort of pre-building their stems as they go. If that is your world, then what I suggest to you is do your generalized reverbs in the Pro Tools world, and then at the end of that, you can deliver me your Pro Tools session so that I have your reverbs and I can duplicate them by as many stems as you know uh, are necessary and I could start from where you left off, which is really the ultimate thing. You know, that's what I always want to do is start where you left off. So I could just make it a little bit better. Um, having said that, if you know what stems you need delivered for the final delivery, color code them, color code the tracks that you want me to combine into the stems. It makes things very easy for me and it really limits the amount of mistakes that can happen. Although me and my team have gotten really good at it. You always want to include dialogue and effects you always want to include your mock-up, which is what I'm referring to. It's the most important track in your session is your mock-up, because I know how hard you've worked to get this thing approved, and I know how, how much you've, time you've spent to get this thing, you know, so that your director and your producer and your editor and everyone likes it, and I don't want to go too far away from that sound. So unless I can hear that mix, I don't know what I'm doing. Uh, if there's a temp, send me the temp also so I can see what the initial temp was, and obviously send me a MIDI map you know, my, give me my bars and beats and all that stuff so that my, my delays can be timed to match your track. Um, and this is something that isn't necessarily for me, but something I would suggest to you is you want to start your sessions at either bar three or bar five. The easiest reason for that is if they need you to start something before the session starts, you have some bars before it to do that in. I'm probably not telling anyone anything they don't know there. Um, and for those of you that are delivering me a single piece of music, that isn't tied to a picture, make sure you start your session at zero hours and then your sequence at one hour. You don't wanna have it so that your regions start at the very, very beginning of the session because if I have to nudge anything, I would have to cut the region to nudge it backwards, which is easy, but it's a pain in the ass. So if you start at zero hours in your, in your Pro Tools session and then start your region, and this is just if you're doing like a theme or an individual piece or a song like that. Um, if you have specific notes of stuff that you need me to know, you can write it in a separate email. I highly suggest you put it in comments in the Pro Tools or in the um, in the uh, you know which we call the time mark the marker time uh, strip if you know what I mean. Um, and if you're using a radical effect on something and it's really really cool and you and you love it, print it. But then give me a track that doesn't have it and send me the track, even if it's a Logic track or a Cubase track, with the plugins on it, chances are I'm gonna have your plugins. If, if, it's an audio, if it's a plugin that processes audio, I've got it, you know, and if not, I'll buy it if I'm doing a project with you. That's just sort of the way I roll. Um, and, you know, there's so many more things. I'm sure I'll think of a million more after Lisa hits stop on this, but that's a good starting point. Go make good music, uh, get really famous, and rich so that I can charge you a lot of money and you can hire me. Thanks a lot, bye.